In this video, we're going to talk about fetal circulation. So as many of you know, in the intrauterine environment, the, the fetus um, doesn't ventilate the way we do in the outside world. The lungs aren't ventilated with air. They are filled with amniotic fluid and the fetus will sort of practice breathe by making respiratory efforts, breathing in and out that fluid, which helps maintain the FRC of the lungs as they develop. But what it doesn't do is provide any sort of gas exchange. Um, so therefore the fetus needs a source of oxygen for the blood and it needs a way of clearing the metabolic waste products of its development, such as carbon dioxide and other waste products, um, out of its system. So that's really where the placenta and the fetal circulation start to come in. So we're going to talk a little bit about those. So the placenta is really the, um, the source of oxygen for the fetus. It's the connection between the, mo the mother and fetus that allows separation of that blood while still allowing transport of gases such as oxygen in and carbon dioxide out and also a source of sort of hormonal um, secretion. So it connects to the fetus via the umbilical cord and that cord consists of one vein and two arteries usually. Um, and the oxygenated blood from the, from the mother uh, enters the fetus via the umbilical vein. So when it enters, it's going to enter into the, through the umbilicus. So we'll pull this next bit up here. And this is the most oxygenated that the blood is going to be when it's in the fetus. It usually has a PO2 at this point of around 55. So let's just get a color out and draw that down. So a PO2 here, PO2 of around 55. But don't take too much notice of some of the numbers here. This is more about the concepts of, of oxygenated blood, deoxygenated blood, and getting that most oxygenated blood to the most important organs. And that's really a key concept of understanding fetal circulation, is we want to get the best blood, the, the blood with the most oxygen in it, to the liver, to the, um, to the heart, and to the brain. And you'll see how some of the shunts that we talk about allow that to happen. Okay, so we have this beautiful, nicely oxygenated blood entering the fetus via the umbilical vein. Then it's going to get to the liver and get to a bit of a crossroads. Some blood is going to go into the liver to perfuse that. That's developing and it's an important structure for the fetus. So it's going to enter via the portal vein and feed the liver tissue itself as it develops. That blood will then drain into the hepatic veins and join the inferior vena cava through the hepatic veins like it normally does. However, if all of that really oxygenated blood went to the liver, then we wouldn't have any more or we would use it all up before we got to our other super important structures that we talked about, like the, the heart itself and the brain. So we need some way of sort of, um, sort of saving some of that nice oxygenated blood for those other structures. So there's this structure called the ductus venosus, which is the first of our sort of fetal shunts. And what that does is it, it bypasses the liver and allows about 50%, about half of that really nice oxygenated blood from the umbilical vein to just straight up bypass the liver and join up with the IVC, the inferior vena cava. Okay, so that's the kind of first and most important point. We've got the ductus venosus, helps shunt some of that really nice oxygenated blood past the liver so it can go to the other organs. But we're still giving some of it to the liver so it can develop well. So once we get past the IVC, the IVC we're going to enter the heart and that's where things really start to get fun. So the blood entering the right atrium is going to come from two places. Firstly it's going to come from this really nice oxygenated IVC blood that we had um, and secondly it's going to come from the head and neck and the upper extremities through this deoxygenated blood from the superior vena cava. And the oxygen saturation of this deoxygenated blood is around 40% whereas the nicely oxygenated blood from the IVC is coming in with a saturation of around 70%. Okay, so then we said our goal is to get that blood to the heart itself and to the brain. So to do that, we need to cross from the right side of the heart, the right atrium here, into the left side of the heart. So the second of our fetal shunts is called the foramen ovale. And that allows, just undo that, that allows this nicely oxygenated blood to shunt across into the left atrium so that we can pump it out to the brain and to the heart, okay? But some interesting things happen here. The flow through the IVC is kind of directed at the frame in a valley, which is helpful because that's the direction we want it to go. And there's a sort of streaming effect of that blood that flows it through the frame in a valley. So that's one factor. 
Another factor that helps this shunting from right to left is there's a part of the septum secundum here called the crista dividens, and that's sort of located up here. And that crista dividens sort of acts almost like a little flap, as it were, and helps kind of direct some of that blood flow from the IVC across into the left atrium. So that's a useful, a useful little structure. The next thing that happens is that um, the blood coming from the SVC, you might think, well, if there's poorly oxygenated blood coming down from here and really nicely oxygenated blood coming from here, why doesn't this all just collide and ruin this whole process, right? And that would be a very logical thing to think. Um, and it's actually quite remarkable how these two streams of blood manage to stay quite separated. So the there's an effect called the Coander effect, and if you've ever tried to pour tea out of a teapot or beer out of a pitcher of beer, you may have come across this. And that's this tendency of fluids to kind of hug the surfaces of what they're traveling over. Um, so when you've poured a beer out of a pitcher and it kind of catches the lip of the pitcher and then runs down and drips all over the table, that's the Coanda effect. That's fluids hugging the surfaces of what they're traveling along. So the blood from the SVC kind of hugs the anterior right atrial wall and kind of stays out the way of this jet of blood coming from the IVC. So that's a really important factor. Okay, so we're in the left atrium. This nicely oxygenated blood from the IVC has come in and it's in the left atrium. In the left atrium, it's going to get joined by some poorly oxygenated blood from the lungs through the pom four pulmonary veins. But remember, the lungs aren't ventilated in utero, so that's going to be a pretty small amount of blood because there's not a lot of perfusion to the lungs in utero. So this nicely oxygenated red blood here is going to get joined by a very small amount of poorly oxygenated blood from the lungs. It's going to go through the mitral valve and be ejected by the left ventricle out into the aorta. Okay? In the aorta, the SAT is around 65%, which is pretty close to this SAT that we had of 70 shunting across. We've preserved that pretty well. When it gets, when it gets to the ascending aorta after being ejected from the left ventricle, that blood is going to go to a few places. We said that we our priority is to get this nicely oxygenated blood to the brain, right? So about 60% of the blood that's ejected from the left ventricle goes up into the head and neck through the carotids and the subclavian arteries. About 30% of it will go into the descending aorta, around the arch of the aorta, into the descending aorta, and it will provide um, blood to the rest of the body here. So it'll bring up the descending aorta here, will go off to the kidneys and the gut and all the other stuff that needs to be perfused. And around 10% of that really nice oxygenated blood is going to go through the coronary circulation to feed the heart muscle itself. Okay, so just through these two shunts, we've pretty much achieved some of the things that we wanted to do. We've got nicely oxygenated blood to the liver, and we've got nicely oxygenated blood to the heart and to the brain. Okay, so now let's go back and see where the rest of the blood goes. We had this stream of poorly oxygenated blood from the head and neck that entered the right atrium. We talked about how that coander effect keeps it out of the way of the IVC jet, and it will go through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. Now, a little bit of that blood from the IVC is obviously going to mix and add into the right ventricle. These aren't going to stay perfectly separated. So we now have a sort of mixed uh, oxygenation blood here in the right ventricle, denoted by this purple color. And in, the, in, the, um, in fetal physiology, the right ventricle is really the powerhouse, whereas the left is more so when, when we transition to adult life. So about two-thirds of the cardiac output is is um, from the right ventricle. So that's gonna pump out into the pulmonary artery. And now, um, now we've gotta think about what's gonna happen. Well, we've already said that the lungs aren't ventilated, right? So we don't really wanna have a huge amount of blood go into the lungs that aren't ventilated. That's, it seems um, that wouldn't make a lot of sense. Um, and so there's this shunt here. This is the third of our fetal shunts, and it's called the ductus arteriosus. And about 90% of this output from the pulmonary artery just goes shunts right across and joins the descending aorta and goes down and provides oxygen to the rest of the body. And the, one of the reasons that that happens is a process um, called hypoxic vasoconstriction in the lungs. When the lungs are poorly ventilated and there's poor oxygen tension in the alveoli themselves, the vessels surrounding the alveoli will constrict. And that's called hypoxic 
vasoconstriction. Vasoconstriction. And you can see why I write stuff out before we start hey, my handwriting. Um, so what that hypoxic vasoconstriction does is it causes a very high pulmonary vascular resistance. The resistance to blood flow into the lungs is very high because of this hypoxic vasoconstriction. Therefore, the path of least resistance for this blood in the pulmonary artery is to cross over the ducts arteriosus and join the descending aorta to feed the rest of the body. Okay, so that's the next shunt. So then what happens is that blood goes down, it's kind of a mix of our nicely oxygenated and mixed oxygenated blood, goes down, feeds the rest of the body. Now some of that blood is gonna return back to the placenta by the umbilical veins, sorry, by umbilical arteries, my apologies, and those come off these guys, and these are the internal iliacs. Okay, so off the internal iliacs are the umbilical arteries here, so we can just point these out. Okay, so deoxygenated blood returns to the um, placenta by the umbilical arteries to go undergo gas exchange and then come back in through the umbilical vein. So that's really the fetal circulation. Okay, so next I want to talk a little bit about fetal oxygenation and some key concepts that there are there. And this is really quite important because you think to yourself, well, we have this PO2 of 55 how is it that the fetus is able to sustain itself with a PO2 of 55? When we know that in, in the adult in adult life, that probably wouldn't be um, that wouldn't be sufficient to oxygenate an adult, right? So how is it that the fetus is able to do that? So the first the first reason is that fetal hemoglobin is different to adult hemoglobin. It has a much, much higher affinity for oxygen, which allows it to uptake oxygen from the placenta at a much greater rate than at a given PO2 than adult hemoglobin would. So this specialized fetal hemoglobin is, is one of the main reasons that the fetus is able to stay well oxygenated. The next thing is that the fetus has a much lower oxygen consumption than an adult does. If you think about the things that we use energy for, well, we've got to stay warm. Well, the fetus doesn't have to regulate its own temperature because it's in the amniotic fluid, and that fluid temperature is regulated by the mother's energy systems, right? So it doesn't have to thermoregulate. We spend a lot of energy breathing, just making respiratory effort. The fetus, fetus doesn't really have to do that. It's taking care for it because it's getting its oxygen from the placenta. GI, in terms of eating, we eat a lot of food, which needs to be processed and go through our GI system. That takes up a lot of energy. The fetus doesn't really have those concerns. It gets a lot of its energy stores from the placenta and from the mother. And the same with processing things through the kidneys. That glomerular filtration rate is much lower. So the oxygen consumption in the fetus is much lower than it is in the adult. And that helps it tolerate lower PO2s much better. And finally, we have this preferential blood flow. And if there's anything you remember from this, is remember that the shunts that are in place allow us to get the most oxygenated blood to the most vital organs. So these shunts allow the best blood to get to the liver, the heart, and the brain. Okay? And that's a reason, one, another reason why the fetus is able to tolerate slightly lower incoming PO2s. It's because it has these mechanisms to get the best blood to the organs that need it the most. Okay? So let's recap a little bit. Umbilical vein brings the blood in. Half of it goes to the liver, half of it shunts through the ductus venosus. Entering the IVC, the streams across into the left atrium, through the left ventricle and out into the aorta. 60% goes up into the head and neck, 30% goes down to the body, and the remaining 10 feeds the heart itself. This is this nice oxygenated blood. Coming from the SVC, this blood kind of, the coronary effect keeps it away from the jet from the IVC, enters the right ventricle with a little bit of the IVC blood, ejected into the pulmonary artery by that powerhouse right ventricle. Now the high pulmonary vascular resistance in the lungs creates the most preferential flow to go through the ducts arteriosus. That's the pass of lethal resistance. So 90% of this RV ejection goes through the ducts arteriosus into the descending aorta, feeds the body, and then goes back to the placenta by the umbilical arteries. I hope that's helpful and I'll see you in the next video.